Welcome to the first part of the software manufacturing platform video series. In this video, we'll understand why we need the software manufacturing platform and learn about its different components. In today's hyper-competitive climate, businesses must rapidly deliver applications and features to stay competitive. As an author by the name of Hitton Shah put it, you don't win by getting there first or having the best idea. You win by continually solving the problem better. When you build a feature that is extremely popular or successful, the competition will steal it. However, if businesses don't temper speed with a focus on quality, then they end up just defeating the purpose of going faster. Because as quality deteriorates, businesses end up using their resources on fixing internal issues rather than identifying and solving customer problems. To prevent quality problems, businesses must control environment variables and standardize processes. To improve velocity, they must remove slow and erroneous manual activities. All of this can be achieved, as with most human endeavors, through automation. Automating the software manufacturing process, therefore, is imperative to a software organization's competitiveness. And that's where the software manufacturing platform comes in. The SMP is a framework that helps organizations automate their software manufacturing process to enable business agility while improving quality. Now before we get to the details of the software manufacturing platform, let's understand its essence by learning about the underlying theory. The software manufacturing platform is an implementation of the dynamic control system model which is illustrated by this block diagram. In this diagram, you provide an input to the controller, which in turn triggers the system to modify the environment, thereby producing some output. Take, for example, an air conditioning system. You use a control panel, the controller, to turn on the AC, the system, and cause it to emit cool air. However, if we only had the controller and the system in place, your AC will not stop emitting cool air causing the room to get colder than your desired temperature. And it'll continue to do that unless you manually turn it off. In this scenario, we don't really have a dynamic control system. And so the third critical component in a dynamic control system is the sensor, which enables the system's feedback loop. The feedback loop captures information about the external environment and feeds that back to the controller, which uses that information to automatically regulate the system. In our AC example, that feedback loop is provided by the thermostat. When it detects that your desired temperature has been reached, it feeds that back to the controller, which in turn causes the AC to stop emitting cool air. So what does a dynamic control system have to do with the SMP? Everything, because the SMP itself is a dynamic control system. To be more concrete, the application architecture serves as the input while a consumable application is the output. It also has a feedback loop that contains more information than a thermostat would. Some examples of these information are unit test results, code coverage reports, and other reports. Now a side note, when I say architectural blueprint, I'm actually referring to the source code because no matter how detailed your diagrams and design documents are, if they don't get translated to code, they do not represent the architecture. This is an important mindset to adopt because it opens up new realizations for the organization. For example, in this mindset, software engineers are not part of the platform. They are part of the design team that drafts and feeds the blueprint to the SMP. In this mindset, you will realize that software engineers are not just encoders. They are the organization's ultimate architects, and that helps you understand how they must be equipped so that they produce sound software architecture. So the architecture is fed into the system, which produces either a packaged application or a running software service. The form of the measured output, fed back by the sensor in this context, depends on which stage of the platform you're in. For instance, early on, it could be unit test results. At a later stage, it could be integration or end-to-end -end test results. We'll know more about these different feedback loops some other time, but the point of the diagram is to show you the underlying principle upon which the SMP is built.
As we go through the series, you'll see that we actually implement the SMP as a concentric set of dynamic control systems, where the inner loops provide fast feedback while the outer loops provide more rigorous feedback. One more thing before we move on. If you find that your team is unable to consistently deliver, check your feedback loops. Chances are they're not being given the respect and attention that they need. In fact, I encourage you to pause this video right now. List down your team's feedback loops and gauge their efficacy. Ask yourself, how can you improve them? And just as important, are there feedback loops that are missing? Go ahead and pause the video now, then, when you're ready, hit play. Alright, so let's now look at the SMP and its various components. The platform is divided horizontally into two periods, build time and deploy time. Components in build time are responsible for ingesting and transforming the architectural blueprint, aka the source code, into a consumable application. Components in deploy time are responsible for instantiating a host environment and then deploying the application into it. The platform is also divided vertically into two layers, infrastructure and application. Components in the infrastructure layer are concerned with the host environment, whereas components in the application layer are concerned with the application itself. So let's now learn about the components themselves. The first component is the source repo. This is the single source of truth for your application architecture. As I mentioned earlier, your application's architecture is not in the diagrams and design documents. Those are just transient representations of your architecture. The final blueprint of your application is the source code. Now, there are many source repository implementations out there, but Git has become the de facto one for most teams. The second component is the build console. This is the single source of truth in terms of the environment within which your build artifacts are created. That is, it's responsible for creating the artifacts and then coursing them through a series of promotions until they are released or discarded. Note that because this is the environment where your build artifacts are created, it removes the tired and old argument of, well, it builds on my machine. With a build console in place, if it doesn't build there, something is wrong and your team is immediately on the same page, ready to take action against the build problem, rather than arguing within itself whether there is even a problem. Sample implementations of this build console at the infrastructure layer are Jenkins alongside Packer and Ansible to build machine images, whereas on the application layer it could be Jenkins with Docker to build application images. The third component is the package repo. This is the single source of truth for our builds, and obviously it's where our build console stores the build. Take note of the position of the package repository in the platform. Notice that it's positioned at a critical junction point between dev, which is build time, and ops, which is deploy time. To put it in another way, the software manufacturing platform is a multi-threaded environment where the major threads are dev, build time, and ops, deploy time, and their synchronization point is the package repository. Without a properly managed package repository, you don't have a proper synchronization point, which will result in platform instability. In our case, we've standardized on JFrog Artifactory as our package repo. The fourth component is the deployment console. The deployment console is the single source of truth in terms of the environment where you deploy your application, whereas the build console invalidates the argument of well, it builds on my machine. The deployment console invalidates the argument of, well, it deploys from my machine. So this component, therefore, puts everyone on the same page if a deployment fails. Just as with the build console, when problems arise, it could very well be that the problem is with the environment itself. Regardless, the team will be on the same page, ready to decisively take action and move on as quickly as possible. For our organization, we're using Rundeck, but we're also beginning to explore the possibility of using other implementations. The fifth component is the resource model. The resource model is the thing that you'd use to describe the environment where your artifact will live. For the infrastructure layer, 
we use stacky pallets and carts on bare metal, and Terraform config files for virtual infrastructure. For the application layer, we're using Kubernetes manifests. The final component is the resource manager. This is the component in the platform that consumes the resource model along with the builds that were produced at build time to produce a live application or service. For the infrastructure layer, we use AWS or vSphere if we're talking about virtual infrastructure, and Stacky if we're talking about bare metal. For the application layer, that's Kubernetes. Note that this diagram does not describe the process that your blueprint would go through to produce the final output. This is just a diagram that shows the different components of the SMP, and at which points in time they will be used, whether it's in build time or deploy time. How they will work together is something that we'll cover later in the series. Now it's important to note that the SMP is nothing new. It's been around for some time now, but under various names such as CICD or the Service Delivery Platform. Here's an original talk from 2012 by Damon Edwards and Anthony Shortland where they talk about the different components of a Service Delivery Platform. When you watch the video, you'll notice the same components that we saw earlier, and that's because this is the inspiration for the software manufacturing platform. Their talk, however, is focused more on software as a service delivery. However, the same platform can be used for packaged software, such as in our case, which is why we instead use the term software manufacturing platform, which makes it more inclusive of software that's not necessarily delivered as a service. To summarize this part of the series, if we have to zero in on just one benefit of the software manufacturing platform, it's this. By having a platform with a single source of truth for every critical part, the team starts to act like a single organism. It's no longer just a group of individuals that happen to be on the same team. Rather, they work together as a single organism to find problems and fix them as quickly as possible. To put it in another way, the SMP is a way to fast track your team through the forming, storming, and norming phases and onto the performing phase. Ultimately, that means business agility and improved quality. So that's the overview of the software manufacturing platform. In part two of this series, we'll talk about the workflow that the platform enables, as well as how it allows for an agile gated build and release process that ensures high velocity but prevents architectural errors from causing system instability. In the meantime, thank you for watching.